Blessed be the one, holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. May God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son restored Mary Magdalene to health of body and mind, and called her to be a witness of his resurrection, mercifully grant that by your grace we may be healed from all our infirmities and know <laughs> you in the power of his unending life, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, 
now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Judith. Judith prostrated herself, put ashes on her head, and uncovered the sackcloth she was wearing. At the very time when the evening incense was being offered in the house of God in Jerusalem, Judith cried out to the Lord with a loud voice and said, Your strength does not depend on numbers, nor your might on the powerful, but you are the God of the lowly, helper of the oppressed, upholder of the weak, protector of the forsaken, savior of those without hope. Please, please, God, my father, God of the Israel, of the heritage of Israel, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of the waters, king of all your creation, hear my prayer. Make my deceitful words bring wound and bruise on those who have planned cruel things against your covenant and against your sacred house and against Mount Zion and against the house of your children possess. Let your whole nation and every tribe know and understand that you are God, the God of all power and might, and that there is no other who protects the people of Israel but you alone. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The love of God urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Mary Mac by the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw the light. Had been lying, one at the head, and the other. Why are you weeping? They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, What? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. speak in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. Based on an entirely informal and not remotely scientific survey of members of the Episcopal Church over the years, I think it is safe to say that many of us actually know very little about Mary Magdalene. That said, when pressed, there is a general sense that some kind of scandal attends her, or at least her legacy. We might remember vaguely that she was a disciple of Jesus, someone mentioned more than once in all four of the Gospels, which alone is remarkable. But her presence is somehow disquieting, subject to rumor and conjecture. She was a prostitute, many assert, as if it were fact, even though scripture never once says this. She was, maybe, Jesus' lover, or perhaps his secret wife, an idea popularized by the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, the best-selling book and blockbuster film The Da Vinci Code, and most recently, Sue Monk Kidd's lovely novel, The Book of Longings. Very few people remember that which is arguably the most incredible and biblically sound truth about her that she is, according to all of the Gospels, among the very first people to witness the resurrection of Jesus, and according to John's Gospel, the first one. Given that the definition of being a Christian disciple, being an evangelist, being a preacher, is proclaiming the good news of Christ crucified and risen, 
She is the first true disciple of our faith, the first evangelist, the first person to bear the great good news of Christ's victory over death for the world. Christians often think of the 12 male disciples of Jesus as the apostles, the first to spread the word of Jesus abroad. But given that they scattered when Jesus was taken into the custody of Roman soldiers and were locked away in an upper room when the resurrection was first revealed, we should ask, who told them? Well, Mary Magdalene told them, either alone or in the company of others. Beloved, committed, faithful, persistent, defiant, courageous, Mary Magdalene. It is out of a recognition of this tremendously powerful and distinct ministry that she's become known as the Apostle to the Apostles, a title first given by Bernard of Clairvaux in the 11th century and officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church in 2016. So why do we not immediately think of Mary Magdalene as persistent, strong, capable, chosen, and instead seem to default to an image of her as a lady of the night, a woman whose gender and sexuality alike both scandalize and distress, eclipsing all other aspects of who she was and what she did. The simplest answer often being the right one, many scholars assert that this is an excellent example of plain old misogyny. We hear this word so frequently that it's helpful to be reminded now and again of its actual definition. Hatred of, aversion to, or prejudice against women. Unlike the male disciples, the scriptural witness about Mary Magdalene is impeccable. She's mentioned in Luke 8 as one of many women who joined Jesus and the Twelve as he moved through the cities and villages of Galilee she is specifically named as a benefactor of his movement, someone who put not only her prayers behind Jesus, but also her voice and her body and her energy and her money, along with the resources of her family. The presence of Mary, as well as of Joanna and Susanna and many others, troubles the traditional notion of Jesus and his all-male band of followers wandering the countryside. The only detail we glean from this passage about Mary is that she had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. There isn't a reference to her being cured of seven spirits, though that has become part of her legend. But we do know that before Mary of Magdala became the apostle to the apostles, she was someone who was afflicted by suffering, someone who desired liberation enough to allow Jesus to set her free, to heal her. Before Mary witnessed to his resurrection, she allowed him to bring her back to life. She allowed herself to be reborn. In this sense, she began bearing witness to the power of the resurrection in her own life long before that first Easter Sunday. Unlike many of the disciples who quibbled about who was the greatest, who continued to misunderstand Jesus' teachings even as they tried to follow him, who struggled to trust him, and who ultimately abandoned and betrayed him in the hour of his greatest need, Mary was steadfast. Mary does not abandon him to walk the road of sorrows alone, like all of the male disciples did. She's actually found at the foot of the cross, weeping, willing to companion him even in death. Mary does not deny him, as Peter does three times, afraid and ashamed to be caught in his company. Mary does not hide when the terrible deed is done, like the men, but goes to the tomb in the morning to anoint the body, to tend him, to be close. Mary does not insist that she put her hand in his side, like Thomas but recognizes him. Teacher, she cries, as soon as her name falls from his lips, standing in the garden, where so many of God's best stories begin. And yet, we don't speculate about Thomas's sexuality. 
There are no wild rumors of James' indiscretions. We don't remember even Peter for his cowardice alone, though this is recorded in scripture. There are no stories about his sordid past passed down through the generations, no whispers of impropriety, even though we have that searing scene where Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And he responds again and again, you know that I do, Lord, pleading. Can you imagine what the church would have done with such a dialogue if it had been between Mary and Jesus? Let me be clear that I would have no problem with the apostle to the apostles having been a prostitute. Nor would I be troubled if solid evidence emerged showing that Mary Magdalene and Jesus did have an intimate relationship. I would not find the teachings or the witness of either one bit less powerful. The question is, why? of all of the disciples, has only Mary Magdalene's reputation been so tarnished by the stories told about her? Why is she so often reduced to aspects of her sexuality and then debased on this basis? Many have pointed out that in ancient times, as in our own, the only roles women are allowed to occupy with consistency are that of virgin and prostitute. And Christianity already had a Virgin Mary, which leaves Mary of Magdala vulnerable to distortion and misrepresentation. It wasn't until 591 that Pope Gregory I preached a sermon claiming that she had been a prostitute. But earlier texts also contain a certain ambivalence about a woman being so close to the life and ministry of Jesus. Several of the non-canonical texts that is, letters and gospels written around the same time as the New Testament that tell similar stories about Jesus and his disciples but were not included in the Bible, imply that many of the male disciples resented how close Mary and Jesus were. Perhaps they resented also her willingness to trust their teacher, her faithfulness. In a recent article from Sojourners magazine, The Reverend Kendall Ray Rothfuss wonders if perhaps Mary Magdalene makes us and so many generations of Christians uncomfortable, not just because she is a woman, but because she fought her demons and emerged fully human, which is something most of us are still too afraid to try. If Mary Magdalene and the other women of the Bible had been able to tell their own stories, or even if the earliest accounts of their involvement in the Christian movement had been maintained and not manipulated, who knows what we might know about their experience, about transformation and discipleship, about Jesus himself. One of the markers of a misogynistic culture, which Christendom has been for much of our history, is that no matter how upright and inspiring a woman is, she can still be reduced to an object, a disgrace, if not in her lifetime, then in the telling of history, which is unlikely to honor her story. Which is why the stories we tell and how we tell them matter so very, very much. The Monuments Project, launched in 2020, is concerned with telling a different container story than that of our faith, the story of our country. Funded by an an unprecedented $250 million gift by the Mellon Foundation, it seeks to express, elevate, and preserve the stories of those who have often been denied historical recognition and explores how we might foster a more complete telling of who we are as a nation. The Monuments Project is not concerned with the removal of historical monuments, although they do note several times in their research that the landscape of monuments across the U.S. has always been dynamic, and the first formal monument removal actually happened in 1776. Rather, this initiative seeks to explore the story of our national history that is told through the physical representation of public sculptures, art, plaques, and other visual media And then to ask, is this story accurate? And who has been left out? 
As part of this effort, the project completed a national monument audit, which created a detailed database of existing monuments and then analyzed them according to various metrics. What they discovered is perhaps not surprising, but nevertheless deeply troubling. The monument landscape of this country is overwhelmingly white and male. Of the top 50 individuals represented, more than half are men who owned, who enslaved other humans. Only five are people of color, and only three are women. Joan of Arc, Harriet Tubman, and Sacagawea. Moreover, they found that female bodies, when they do appear in monuments, tend to be found in the background, often as fictional, mythological, or allegorical figures. They note that there are more recorded monuments depicting mermaids, 22, than there are monuments to US Congresswomen, of which there are two. The most common historical theme that American monuments reflect is war and conquest. A full third of all of these public figures, public sites remember battles, slaughters, military campaigns, mass graves, and the sites of treaties. The National Monument Audit concludes, the story of the United States as told by our current monuments misrepresents our history. It overemphasizes certain themes and people and leaves out other important truths and perspectives. While I'm not aware of a national or global audit of Christian art and monuments, I would guess that it would come to similar conclusions. Women like Mary Magdalene, who were in fact key figures in the history of our church, have either been left out, maligned, or fictionalized in the telling of our history, visually, in oral tradition, and in the written records. While discouraging to name, there is also something inspiring about actually looking at this terrible tendency. And that is the reminder that we do not need to invent from scratch models of women leaders and women disciples and women change agents, or only to point to those from recent history. They have always been there. We simply need to recover their stories and work to set the historical record straight which has implications not only for how we tell Mary's story, but how we tell Jesus' story. Jesus understood that women could be faithful disciples, faithful leaders, were called into ministry, were capable of making good decisions for themselves and their families and their communities, as Mary did in making the good decision for her own body to choose healing and wholeness. Mary's story reminds us not of the scandal of her life, but of the scandal of Jesus' vision. Telling a truer tale about Christian history is not only the work of scholars and preachers and clergy. As the monument audit concludes, history does not live in statues. History lives between people. If you were not already, you are now bearers of the truth of Mary Magdalene's witness and power and strength and wisdom. There she is, hidden in plain sight, an example of a strong, independent, respected female leader and friend of Jesus. We don't have to invent her for our time. We just have to reclaim her. The apostle to the apostles, the one who is willing to choose resurrection not just once, but again and again, the one willing to fight for demons, to risk liberation. There she is, the witness to the transformative power of our faith, Mary Magdalene. Amen.
invite you to stand as you are able. And together let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in God, the Father, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all the world. Let us pray. We pray for all people who know you and seek you. We pray for the world and all who work for justice and peace. We pray for all creation and every living thing. Send down your spirit, Lord, and fill us with your grace. We pray for the lost, the forgotten, and those in any kind of need. Send down your spirit, Lord, and comfort us with your life. We pray for those who have died and all those who grieve. We pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the church in Wales. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for all good works by the churches in our diocese. We pray in thanksgiving for our parish school, Ventana. We pray for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and those in any trouble. Gloria Wing, Jackie, Jean, Rick, Azure, Naya, and Seraphine, Barbara, Jen Berry, Dick Quigley, Tom Forsheimer, John, Ian, Lisa Kabuligan, Anna, Kristen, Carolyn, Frank Heistan, Derek, Linda Bell, Larry Van Note, Shirley Shaw, Glenn Bowman, Carmen, Kathy Myers, Sean Moore, Richard and Diane Goodwin, Eric Anderson, Beverly, Kate Webster, Bob Geary, Sue Boleyn, Sarah and family, Vadim Kochinov, Jennifer, Marjorie King, Sterling Hill, the Stansberry and Kendrick families, and Julie Arnheim. We pray for the people of Ukraine and all whose lives continue to be disrupted by the pandemic. We pray for the health and safety of girls and women across the country. We pray for the families and victims of mass shootings and for the families who have been evacuated due to the wildfires near Yosemite. We pray for those who have entered eternal life and those who mourn them, especially Hal Perry, 
and William Stansberry. We give thanks for answered prayers, and I invite your own prayers of intercession or thanksgiving, either spoken aloud or in the silence of your heart. Creator God and giver of life, pour out your spirit upon the whole creation. Come in rushing wind and flashing fire, in courage and inspiration, to turn the sin and sorrow within us into faith, power, and delight. For your love's sake. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins that we may receive God's grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I think everybody knows the next part. People on Zoom, please, you, this is your opportunity to unmute yourselves temporarily. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Yes, also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace be with you, Randy and Nancy. Peace. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's wonderful to worship with you today. Um, a few announcements. First, we'll invite those on Zoom to remute yourself if you haven't already. Um, recognizing the current wave of uh, COVID that we find ourselves in, the diocese has asked us to suspend use of the common cups. So we will continue to distribute wine in the little cups on both sides of the altar rail. Um, when we're able to bring that back, we will. Um, also, our in-person coffee hour is going to be temporarily on hold, uh, but we'll bring it back when that starts to feel um, good again to the volunteers who are making it happen uh, week after week. Um, those of you on Zoom are still welcome to gather afterward for a little conversation online. Um, the announcements in the back of the bulletin detail several of the actions of the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, which is now over. Um, in two days, though, Lambeth con Conference is going to happen, which is a gathering of all of the bishops in the Anglican Communion. It takes place in the UK, um, and there is quite a bit of uh, trepidation amongst our bishops. Um, our general convention passed about 14 resolutions without much comment and without any controversy, um, upholding the full inclusion of those who identify as LGBTQ in our church. Um, this is a point historically of great tension with the rest of the communion, and um, there's reason based on the documents that came from the Archbishop of Canterbury's um, office preparing for Lambeth to think that uh, it's going to be, again, a topic of um, some conversation when they gather. So um, everyone is invited by our presiding bishop, our bishop, uh, to pray for the bishops of the Anglican communion in the days ahead. Um, there's actually a prayer that has been put out that we'll put in the newsletter as well um, to commend to you for your use. Finally, speaking of bishops, on Friday, um, our own bishop, Bishop Mark Andrus, announced that he is retiring. Uh, so this is a long and slow process in our church, so um, he will be in the diocese functioning as our bishop still for about two years um, at the highest level 
uh, search committee will be called soon. Um, applicants will be invited to apply. Um, the idea is that we will elect our next bishop at general convention in 2023. They'll be consecrated in May of 2024. They'll overlap for a few months with Bishop Mark, and Bishop Mark will officially um, step away and actually move to Virginia, where he and his wife intend to retire in July of 2024. Um, so there'll be a lot of announcements coming about what that means, how we as members of the Diocese of California can participate in calling our next bishop. Uh, and Bishop Mark will actually be doing a visitation here at Christ Church in October, so we'll have an opportunity as a parish to be with him again before he does retire. Um, but of course it means a lot of transition for the diocese um, and a lot of work for the committees, the lay and the clergy people um, involved in leadership. So. Um, we'll have more information about that, including a link to Bishop Mark's written uh, address and announcement in the newsletter as well. I think that's Nothing in the Episcopal Church happens fast, does it? <laughs> so let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
All things come of you, O God. As of your own shall we give you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, for you We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of blood, the body, the body of Christ, and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in harmony under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him 
and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The divine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God, holy food for holy people. This is God's table, and all are welcome to us. Let us pray. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. Since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace. And grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. May God bless you with this comforted, easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may learn to live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger and injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, reconciliation, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, starvation, disease, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with just enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, so that you can indeed do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this fine day and forevermore. Let us go forth in the, the rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia.